Well, I think I will start. Welcome to the February uh, lecture. Uh, today, uh, we're going to be hearing from Dr. Gerald Coyman, who is Research Professor Emerita, Emeritus excuse me, at the Center for uh, Marine Biotechnology and Biomedicine at the Scripps Institute of Oceanography. Uh, and he's held that appointment since uh, 1994. Jerry was educated at UCLA, graduating with a BA in biology in 1957, and uh, received his PhD in zoology from the University of Arizona in 1966. He's held academic positions as a postdoctoral fellow at the University of London and at SIO and was assistant and associate research physiologist at SIO, and then subsequently professor in residence um, <clears throat> at uh, SIO. His areas of interest have been respiratory physiology, especially in diving reptiles like turtles, birds like penguins, and mammals like seals and whales. He has also had a longstanding interest in the life cycle of emperor penguins. And uh, I was able to, uh, with the help of his wife, uh, come up with several interesting facts about him that I thought I would relate to you. 
the first is that he served for three years as an air squadron intelligence officer between the Korean and Vietnam War uh, wars uh, on the aircraft carrier that is one of San Diego's most popular museums, the Midway. Uh, among, he was among the first under ice scuba divers at the uh, US Antarctic Research Program at McMurdo Sound, uh, and the station there in um, Antarctica. He's a member of the century old New York City based International Explorers Club and a recipient of their uh, Finn Roan Award, and its highest honor for his accomplishments in polar field research. Uh, he was a featured presenter for a royal visit in 1983 and Prince Philip. Philip, who was an avid naturalist and conservationist, requested a session with Jerry, which Philip led off with the question, why don't seals get the bends? Finally, he was PhD advisor to Jessica Meyer, uh, a UCSD graduate and NASA astronaut. During her first space a flight in September of 2019, Jessica conducted the first three all women's spacewalks, which totaled over 21 hours outside the space station. With that, I'd like to turn it over to Jerry. Thank you, Alan, for that very nice introduction. And I, my first question is, can you hear me? I'm. I, not sure. Yes. Yes, we hear you just fine. Oh, you can yeah. you can hear me. Okay. Yeah. Well, we'll yeah. just get started here with this uh, after the nice introduction. What I want to do uh, first is give you an outline of where I'm going with this talk, and uh, I'll give you some background on Antarctica. Not that uh, any of you need it, perhaps, but I'll do it anyway. Uh, from uh, my perspective where I was working with penguins. And then I'll say a few things about penguins in general. And uh, after that, I'm going to talk about what my interest was, and that's the journeys of the penguins. And uh, these were uh, four of them that I'm especially interested in, the foraging for four chicks, uh, in other words, the nurturing period. And then uh, after that, they, uh, they molt, and they need to go to a molt site because all of the pack ice that is within the Ross Sea has pretty much uh, disappeared for the summer season. And uh, so you'll see it makes a long trip. Chicks to the north also depart and I'll dwell on that. It's a very interesting thing. And then uh, from that, I'll also discuss the uh, uh, journey during the molt or after the molt rather. And that sort of closes the circle of uh, what the emperors do over the course of the year. And then I have one uh, about non-breeders and uh, chasing the sun. And I'll probably not get into that on that in this particular talk now. Okay, with that introduction, here is Antarctica 20,000 years ago by, uh, it was rendered by Wally Brecker and George Denton for Scientific American. And what's important here is the red is the ice cap. And what, what the most important aspect is that Antarctica was an entire ice cap. There was very little land showing at all, uh, even less than what it is now, which is about 1% of the uh, area of the land area is covered by, is exposed rock. Uh, it also had a very extensive pack ice around the, the continent. But what's important here is that uh, I think I've got a point. Yeah, you, you could probably see my pointer uh, that the Ross Sea did not exist at that time. It was part of the polar cap. This is also true of the Weddell Sea, so that things were very different. What the emperors were doing there is a mystery. This is uh, when satellite imagery began, and so in. Uh, 1973, this is the first image showing how the continent is surrounded by uh, pack ice, expanding the dimensions of the continent. And then during the uh, summer, 
in uh, February, in January, February, it, it melts back. And so then the Ross Sea becomes an open water uh, embayment of the continent. And finally, there's the uh, Antarctic Polar Front and the Antarctic Circumpolar uh, Current that goes around that. It's the fastest moving current in the, uh, a large current anyway, in the ocean. And it's very dramatic and it isolates Antarctica entirely from the, from the rest of the world. Unlike Australia, which is an island continent, but has had many uh, uh, migrations into and out of Australia during their, their evolution. This give you an idea of dimensions of Antarctica, something we're more familiar with. And so it's, it's about half again as large as the United States in uh, size. And this shows you the distribution of uh, about 45 of the uh, emperor penguin colonies around the continent versus uh, now with further satellite uh, searching They're now up to a number of about 60, I think. Uh, what's important here is what they've shown as far as the uh, uh, seasonal annual temperature condition. And that is that these colonies that are along in the yellow zone are probably uh, in the most at risk of any of the emperor penguins because the sea ice is likely to melt and emperor penguins are totally dependent on uh, sea ice. Uh, they breed on it, they feed beyond it, and use it as a resting egg, and they molt on the sea ice. And so with those kinds of uh, needs, the, uh, the only colonies in this period of warming that might be considered relatively safe were in the Weddell Sea and in the Ross Sea and in a uh, touch in the eastern part of the of uh, the, the continent up by uh, what is, uh, I think this is near Dumont de Ville, which is a French base, but they're having their problems as well. And one of the, one of the ones that's in uh, the most northerly is in a sort of a danger zone is Snow Hill Island. And that's where all the tourists go to want to see emperors. And in fact, I, you know, a normal lecture where I could see the audience, I'd ask for a show of hands of how many of you have been to the Antarctic. And you'd get a, in a crowd like this, you'd get a reasonable amount of people, I think, that have been to the Antarctic. Then the next question would be, how many have seen a penguin in the wild? And of course, if you've gone to the Antarctic, you've seen penguins in the wild, mainly Adelie, Chinstrap, and Gentoos. Most have not seen an emperor penguin. So when you ask that question, huh, how many have seen an emperor penguin in the wild? And the raised hands are much fewer. And then if you say, how many of you have uh, seen emperor penguin chicks in the wild? It gets even uh, fewer. So what it's emphasizing is what I'm going to comment about a few times, in fact, and that is access. And most emperor colonies are beyond access for any kind of reasonable travel except for very high-end tourist travel or very high-end uh, exploratory travel by the, the countries that have uh, the logistics to do that. Well, let's uh, mention the penguins for a while. The only extant penguin in this picture is the emperor penguin. We look at it as a very big penguin. And then you see that back uh, many, back in the other times, 40 or 50 million years ago, there were penguins that were considerably larger than the emperor penguin. And if you give it a size relationship here, here's the emperor penguin. And this is the smallest of the current penguins and that's the little penguin. And then the chinstrap penguins show you how much larger the emperor is. It's, it's 30 times larger than the little penguin. And then this gives you an idea of if you went back 60 million years, what kind of a penguin you might run into and get an opportunity to swim with. Well, this shows the uh, 18 species of penguins that now exist. And that's uh, 
a pretty good representation in terms of birds, considering there's about 10,000 species of birds and 18 of them are uh, penguins. Uh, two of those are endangered, the Humboldt and the Galapagos, actually three because the African penguin, although there's about 20,000 of them are considered uh, endangered as well because they are, uh, uh, their population is declining so rapidly because of competition with fisheries and from oil spills. <coughs> all need cold water. And that goes even for the Galapagos penguin, which lives on the equator, but it lives on the cold side of the Galapagos Islands and in uh, cold currents there. Now this is a rendition of the uh, Ross Sea, where I'm gonna talk most, where I'm gonna talk solely about it. It's where I've had my experience with temperate penguins. And there's, uh, I show this image first, the satellite image is taken in September and it shows how the Ross Sea is completely covered with uh, pack ice and then we'll have, uh, which is ice that is moving around all of the time. It's not fixed anywhere. And then the penguins rely on fast ice, which is land fast ice. It's connected to the land and does not drift around. And there are six here, there's a seventh colony uh, far to the right here at the other side of the Ross Sea. And this is an example of the most southerly colony of Cape Crozier, the first one discovered in 1902. And the first thing that strikes you or should strike you about this colony, which is in this rift here in the Ross Ice Shelf, is the nearness of the ice edge. It's uh, uh, this is a one of this taken probably about uh, November sometime or early December. And it's the smallest, it's probably in part because it's so limited in where they can read and it's in these small cracks, which are unreliable. I don't, they shouldn't be called cracks, they're really canyons, rifts in the uh, Ross Ice Shelf, which is constantly moving past Cape Crozier and being uh, torn apart. And one year, it didn't form rifts in it, and that was 2005. And that year, the birds did not breed at Cape Crozier. Mm. Well, this, this shows uh, in a graphic here of the names of them. Cape Roger is the furthest north from uh, McMurdo Station, which is down here, uh, right in this area here, Ross Island. And that distance is about the same distance of San Diego to San Francisco. And the numbers in parentheses next to them are the total numbers of the chicks for that particular year, which is 2012, when Paul Ponganis and I did the, uh, I think the, well, no, I think 2013, there was a final count done. And uh, it, it's interesting that Cape, the Ross Sea, uh, colonies of Kuhlman, Cape Washington, and now Colbeck, which has increased considerably in the last four or five years, are uh, three of the largest of all emperor penguin colonies. So it's a rich area for emperor penguins. And then there's the smaller colonies here, Franklin Island, Beaufort Island, and uh, Ross Island. And this at, at Ross Island was down in nearly zero at one time in about 2001 or 2000 uh, from a, a disaster by an iceberg. And it's been steadily increasing. And the last count was in, I think I heard about anyways in 2019. And there were 1500 chicks that were, uh, were there. Well, now we'll get to the idea of where to go and uh, well let's go back to that just uh, one time if i can go oh, wrong way okay what I, I i had a decision to make when i decided to work on emperor penguins and that is do i try to work from a uh, uh, established base well established base is mcmurdle station at, uh, in the ross sea and that's all and so that's about a, uh, a 50 to 60 mile an hour journey a short one to uh, cape crozier but it's a small colony and there's some disadvantages of that as well as uh, 
we would want to be camping there and it's there's some disadvantages of uh, camping at Cape Crozier as well. So I look for others and uh, uh, of course none of them have camps or anything. There's most of them have, have, had never been visited. Uh, I looked at uh, Cape Washington and it had been flown over by Ian Sterling, uh, a well-known uh, uh, polar ecologist who's uh, estimated that he, uh, there's about you know, four or 5,000 uh, chicks at Cape Washington. And that was in about 1964 that he made that estimate. Well, that seemed like a reasonable number we wanted. We, so we started thinking about that and also because there's a plate of fast, fast ice there where this dotted line is, where they were there uh, uh, to breed and that fast ice from aerial photographs we got from uh, US uh, uh, Geological Survey showed that it was fairly constant as far as the ice being there. It's annual sea ice, that means it breaks up in the summertime. So, but it would be there long enough to establish a campsite and uh, get some work done. And uh, we followed it and noticed that it didn't break up till about mid-January. So that meant we had a period of time to work on that sea ice. And what we could plan to do was go there and stay for uh, two and a half months. And then we would leave about early January, the 5th of January, and be out of there before uh, uh, the ice breaks up. Now, it's important to leave at that time because I'll show you in the next couple of photos what it is. And here we are, let me give you another perspective. That's New Zealand, 2,200 miles north of uh, McMurdo Station. Cape Washington is about right there. So here it is, right in this location, midway up uh, Victoria Land Coast. And here is the uh, blow up of Terra Nova Bay. And this was the ice age in 1988. I don't know what time of year that was. It was probably in October or November. And in Gerlache Inlet, a month or two after we arrived at Cape Washington, the Italians built or began building a station at Gerlache Inlet. Up until then, we were 200 miles north of McMurdo with uh, no connection with anything between us and McMurdo Station. Well, how to get there? Well, there's a problem about getting to Cape Washington that I ran into, and that is the Navy will not land on sea ice unless it's been cored. Understandable, it's a big heavy airplane. They want to make sure that it could support the aircraft. But it's a conundrum because if you can get there to core it, you can no doubt get there to establish a camp. And so we had a debate about that. We elected to that fly into Priestley Glacier and to trek or traverse to Cape Washington. Well, there are a number of firsts that occur for setting up this camp and doing the work at Cape Washington. The first was that no C-130 had ever landed at Priestley Glacier. And it's, it's one of the windiest places in the world, very strong winds and the, the, what you see in the snow there, unevenness, is what they call sestrugi. And it means that uh, uh, it's very hardened snow from dr drifting. And so when the plane landed on it, it did a couple of things. One was we didn't know this was glacier ice now. So we didn't know if uh, there were crevasses in it. It was so covered with snow. And so what they do is they do a drag. And this drag, they land and then they stay at maximum power or close to it and drag along the surface of the, uh, of the snow that they're gonna land on and create a track. But in that track, there's enough pressure that if there's a crevasse under the snow, it'll break the, the bridge and we would see it. And so they made three passes all in the same place to do that. It's a very rough ride. You would not wanna make a landing like that in any kind of an airplane. It really, I thought it was gonna shake the plane apart. And once they landed, our idea was to be dropped out of the ramp. That's a snowmobile there with our dancing sleds 
and move away from the plane and for it to leave. And then when we get out, we've got to be dressed. And so I, I find it odd today that we have so much of a problem about masking because we had the mask, the work there, it was 20 below and mother nature doesn't mess around. And if you didn't mask, you could get snow frostbite on your nose and that would be very un unpleasant. Well, so here's, here we are with the aircraft at the uh, Priestley Glacier and we've got by the way the crow flies, it'd be about 40 miles to Cape Washington. But you don't have we that went. on your earphone anymore? I do. Well, let's stop that because if you're doing that. It's coming from there. It's not coming from here. But is it going through your ear? Your... Oh, is something coming from me? That... <laughs> Well, anyway, we're uh, so I, I hope I'm still transmitting. Yes, you're fine. Continue. Oh, okay, I'll carry on. Well, okay, so Priestley Glacier. We start the trek with two snowmobiles and two Nansen sleds and with, with a fair bit of gear, but most of our gear has been airdropped at Markham Island. And so what our goal was is in three days, the first time we went, we stopped at the Campbell Glacier and then uh, we had an, uh, a mountaineer with us from Canada, and he was going to be our main guide to get across the glacier, which is heavily crevassed. And then we uh, were to camp at Shield Lunatak. And the reason for camping there was that Shield Lunatak has a ramp. It's the only place you can get down without technical climbing to get down onto the sea ice. We couldn't do technical climbing with these snowball, uh, snow toboggans in, in, in our work. So we, so that was it. We crossed that, camped at Shield, no, noon attack, and then picked up a lot more of our gear, camped at uh, Markham Island as well for a couple of days while we transported gear back and forth to uh, Cape Washington. Well, this is, this is an aerial photo of it. Here would be a Priestley Glacier. You come up and here's the Campbell Glacier. And I must say, uh, uh, some were not encouraging about this. This is the first time the Campbell Glacier had ever been crossed. Uh, and I think it's the last time Campbell Glacier has ever been crossed. And so we got Shield Lunatech, went down there and across that and then over to Markham Island, which is where we had our gear camp. And then it's a piece of cake getting across to uh, the sea ice, which was pretty smooth to Cape Washington. And uh, when we got there, uh, it was just two of us that drove over the first day with some gear to sort of reconnoiter and then go back and get the rest of the gear. But as we were arriving or approaching, penguins started to show up and uh, it got pretty exciting because there were a lot of penguins. In the end, what we discovered after a count was that there were over 20,000 chicks there. So this was our first camp. And these are the famous Scott tents that were, can take any kind of wind and weather. And we were protect, uh, expecting the worst that we would really get some pretty fierce winds. So that was two to a camp. And then we had a weather haven which we did our cooking in and it was used as our science lab. And then uh, the one thing is we had a lot of visitors underfoot all the time. These are penguins, emperor penguins, very curious bird. Well, we perfected things over the years. So I was doing this for over 20 years, in fact. And, uh, and I might add here, the fact that this is a, an Emeriti lecture, that the majority of my years that I spent at Cape Washington, I was emeritus from here. So just because you retire doesn't mean you let go. And uh, this, I think, is a great illustration of our gear for a two month camp. It's, uh, you think about it. These penguins come nothing. They're just what they got with them, their feathers in them. 
and they go get their food. And then for us to survive out there for that time, uh, we have an enormous amount of equipment. We really don't fit. And this is the, uh, one of the final camp that I uh, stayed there in 2010. It was Paul Ponganis's camp. And I was, I was there to help, uh, help out with the work that the team was doing. And we had, it had enlarged for four people. In this case, we had six people there. And I know that because there are six tents here. And there are six tents because early on, we decided to Scott tents uh, we didn't need them. The weather was too mild for that, and we needed our private space. And so each person has their own mountaineering tent. And then we had, uh, in this case, two uh, weather uh, camp uh, large tents for cooking in one and the lab work and radio uh, connections in the other. And the helicopter is, it came over from uh, uh, Terranova Bay Station or uh, Zuccelli Station uh, for, uh, to furnish transport. They were nice enough to uh, to bring us over there from time to time during uh, uh, at Christmas time for a Christmas dinner and shower. This is one of the great attributes of working in the Antarctic or on island populations uh, in other parts of the world. And that is, and, and for especially Cape Washington, the birds are curious and they are approachable. Uh, in this case, they approach you. And this is as close as you'll get by waiting patiently and a bird will come to you. Otherwise, they will move off. So we have a bird that we can get to know well and live with, and uh, yet there's, not uh, the situation of trying to stop them. And of course, if we were in the Arctic, then it would be a wholly different kind of campsite because we would have the fear of polar bears. There are no <coughs> land predators in the Antarctic. <coughs> and this is their early greeting when they come <coughs> in. And they're, they're very curious about the camp. Don't know how to get off that. I went the wrong way. Now, oh, made it. Okay, and the nice thing about a setup with experiment there is you can set up several birds at a, at a time, and that's what we've done here. We have uh, 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 time depth recorders uh, attached to them, and uh, these are uh, were very sophisticated for what we were doing in those days, but uh, this. Uh, uh, these recorders are over 20 years old and they've, it's really, the technology is advanced now. And once we tag them, then the birds work their way out to the ice edge. And uh, the ice edge is the other thing I've said, access to the colony is one thing. Access to the ice edge, this may be the only emperor colony in the world where that's possible. And it's an important place to get access because you get an idea of what is going on there and what the penguins are up against. And here they gather in a group and then at one time they stampede and they stampede and it's not, it's kind of a coordinated stampede, I guess, into the water. And what's happened here is there's thin ice that's only about, oh, four to six inches thick and they can break through that but the disadvantage of it is that leopard seals can see up through that so they can see the birds. This is the departure. I was swinging the camera around a lot because uh, the birds are leaving. This is uh, leaving. You saw some chicks over on the side there. This is late season, and these birds are leaving for to go molt. And uh, 
there's something you're going to see in the next slide, and I wanted to point it out in a still first, and that is you're going to see what we call contrails. Now, there's a hydrodynamicist who did a study of this, and he calls it the uh, bubble reduction drag or something like that, and that it reduces the drag on the birds and helps them to speed up when they're coming, to, rising to the surface to leap out. And it does do that. I, uh, I, I believe he's correct. Almost any adaptation, there's secondary uses too. And here's a use for that. These are birds coming back. And it, it's not as fuzzy as it looks. That's a lot of air bubbles in water. And as you can see, it's creating a cloud right around the hole. And that cloud, I believe, is uh, all the birds are creating contrails, increasing their speed, and, but they're also uh, making it so making it difficult for the birds to be seen. I'll get this straight in. Yeah. And so here's here they are, uh, in this case, coming out in numbers. It's a low foot, so they're not leaping very high. And so you might ask the question, what's the rush? Well, that's the rush. It's the Cape Washington greeter. This is a, a leopard seal. And there's usually three or four of them that will hang out along the ice edge of Cape Washington. And these are rare observations because except for Cape Washington, nobody can get to the ice edge. The ice edges are an unstable place. And uh, we had the remarkable luck uh, and uh, knowledge of what we could do working around that ice edge and not ending up in the water ourselves. And that's the greeting. And so they do prey on uh, emperor penguins there. Uh, other times they're uh, very wide, uh, they're essentially an omnivore. They feed on uh, uh, smaller penguins, uh, fish, and krill. Well, when the birds return, they're part of the rushes to get back and feed the chicks. They've been gone for anywhere from a little over two weeks to almost three weeks. And this record needs a little explaining. And this is uh, the uh, ordinate is uh, the track. That's in meters. That's the depth in meters. And uh, now I'll go back to it again. And this uh, is a compressed record showing the dives and their dive bouts at different periods. On day one, there are a few dives day two, a few more, and they're, they're relatively shallow for an emperor penguin, or uh, usually below 200 meters. And then something happens, and they start diving to depths that are over 400. In this case, these, these dives were over 500 meters deep. And remember, I'm saying meters, not, this is close to 2,000 feet deep that these birds are diving to. And they do this in about a dive that lasts for about eight to 10 minutes, and as you can see, there's many of them here. And it, and it left me, this one's a little shallower, spill a lot of deep dice. Uh, and interesting thing about it is both the Australians and the French were conducting or conducted later uh, these experiments and they rarely uh, saw birds dive to 400 meters. And in the Australian case, Funny enough, there was one bird and only one bird that dived to 500 meters and it set the record for the maximum depth for an emperor penguin and that was 564 meters. Well, what were they making these deep dives for? Uh, for the ones that uh, around the northern part of the continent, I don't know, but in uh, the Ross Sea, it's Pleurogramma antarctica or the Antarctic silverfish and this this is the food base for the Ross Sea, more so, I think, than, than krill that you hear so much about. And so it's a, it's a keystone species, in my, my uh, guess. And it's fed on by emperor penguins, Adelie penguins, leopard seals, weddell seals, minke whales, and probably killer whales. Well. We solved the problem, what was going on about the uh, deep dives with this record that we was turned out to be a proof of concept record we obtained. And Paul turned, uh, I gave him this recorder to put on to test it because we were going to do another series of experiments 
on the eastern side of the Ross Sea. We wanted to know if they really worked well. <laughs> it really worked well. I'll explain this one to you. This is the compressed record again going out. And these are days from the 9th of November, 10th of November, 11th of November, and so on. And this mark around it is the Crary Bank. And that's a shallow area. Shallow meaning this, this is the bathymeter mark at 500 meters. I'll throw in here too also that I knew Bert Crary. He was chief scientist for NSF when I joined the, the program there. Any case, these red areas are near uh, uh, shallow areas, more shallow areas down around 200 meters. But you can see as the bird gets to the bank, it starts diving, diving deep. So suddenly my whole per perspective of emperors have changed from uh, mesopelagic forger or midwater depth feeder to a, to a bottom or benthopelagic feeder. And I think that's how they, why they are so successful at Cape Washington and Coleman Island, for example, and also most likely at, uh, at uh, Cape Kobach. Well, back to the departing of, of uh, penguins. And uh, so let's see what we've got going here. Oh, this is the birds departing uh, for the molt. And uh, so these are two tracks of birds molting. And it was one of the questions I, that came up while we were living with them for so much of the time was where did all the adults go at the end of December? They just, they just disappeared. But well, they're big birds, it's a lot of open water and they could turn up almost anywhere and they probably just went out in the middle of the, of the uh, Ross Sea. But they did go out in the middle, they crossed the Ross Sea and hence the title, Chasing Penguins Across the Ross Sea because we chased them with uh, recorders in this case and found that they were, uh, had gone to uh, uh, the Marie Birdland area near Cape Colbeck, which is right here. And uh, that's where they molded. Now, this is interesting because at, at this time, there's no real fa uh, pack ice in the Ross Sea. These birds have a 35 day molt and they can't go in the water. It's a total mold of the feathers and replacement by their new feathers and they lose waterproofing and so on. And so they have a 35 day fast. So in this time, they leave at 25 kilos and they travel in a direct line that's 1200 kilometers. And they have to weigh in at about 35 to 40 kilos when they arrive in the area to mold because they're going to lose about 50% of their body mass, if not more. And uh, so that's a problem. It's like, you know, it's, it's like driving to San Francisco, actually probably more like driving to Seattle uh, without your, any knowledge of uh, where the gas stations are or how much you can fuel and you've got to uh, gain a lot of fuel while you're on your way. And it's probably that they do know where they're going. What we know about the Ross Sea now that they didn't know at the time that I did this graph was that there are several banks along the way. And so my thesis there is that they, they are feeding at known banks on their way across. Well, the juveniles were even a bigger mystery than the adults because they uh, uh, just completely disappear. And you don't think they have all that great of swimming skills when they, when they leave because this is a bird. We didn't put that transmitter on uh, in anticipation that they were going to go in a couple of weeks or so, you know, and we had to get the recorder on first. This is unusual. No penguin that I'm aware of, no species, goes to sea before it molts all of its downy feather. That's not true of emperors. All emperor chicks go to sea while they're still in 60% down. And, but they disappear. All the tour ships are coming down about the time that the uh, penguins are leaving and uh, 
also the icebreakers and so on. And there's never any report of seeing chicks in the Ross Sea. Well, there's a good reason for that we discovered. One, they're determined to go to sea. When they walk out, walk out to that ice, it's, they've never seen water before. And they walk to it and then they hesitate for a while and then they take the leap. You'll note they're not the greatest swimmers in the world. <laughs> not greatest divers. He's not laughing. Moves my camera. Would it be? <laughs> just all lined up. They're going. They are going. <laughs> and they're going a long way if I can figure out how to. So this is what they look like after they got offshore a little bit, or off the ice edge. And so that's the last we see them, just paddling on the surface and not diving or diving very little. But that skill must come on very quickly. This is what we found. And this was that only we just were able to tag animals from Cape Washington. But we assume it's probably not assume, we're pretty certain that all colonies are like this. And they go, they essentially leave the Ross Sea, they leave the Southern Ocean for a time. They go as far north as about 52 to 54 degrees. And if you look at this plot here, that's New Zealand. They're closer to New Zealand than they are to Cape Washington by the time they start thinking about turning around. And that's not, I should add, that's not a fluke of Ross Sea birds or the Cape Washington colony. There's been studies done at two other colonies, one at Dumont Deville and one at, at uh, from out of Mawson Station for the Australians. In those cases, same thing. They went due north to the same level of uh, high, low latitude of about 52 degrees south. Well, we wanted to find out more about what these birds were doing after, the adult birds were doing after they went to, uh, uh, across the Ross Sea. So transport got more complex. Instead of a twin otter or some other plane, we needed a ship. And we were lucky enough to get on one. And Nathan Palmer is the National Science Foundation contracted ship, beautiful ship. And it took us there on an APIS cruise in 1999. And uh, that's for Antarctic pack eye seals. And they were doing a survey and they felt they needed a, one ornithologist on board. And so I said I was an ornithologist and talked my way into it. Actually, I got invited on it, couldn't have been more pleased. Well, we solved the problem. We knew there was a lot of pack ice out there. We had 30 days uh, that the ice would hold up and not melt. This is not the continent that they're, where these birds are. This is an ice flow. The ice flows, some of them there are huge. This one was as big as the Catalina Island. And they go back, well back into this very rough area so they can get out of the wind if they want and they molt there. So, that mystery was solved as well. It's, it's not a big issue as far as the, the birds having to be really savvy about what ice they get on. And this is a mold and you can get an idea of what a mess they're in for a while while they're losing their feathers. And this is, happens to be a juvenile that is melting. And this is an adult that is melting, molting. And this is, they go from 35 to 40 kilos. And in this case, as I said, they only have, the adults only have about a month, month and a half to gain that weight. And so they lose about 600 grams a day. That's a very high energy consumption because molting itself is very demanding. And so the birds come out weighing, we weigh, the birds we weighed went, ran from 14 and 19 kilos. And that is really at high risk. The birds are weak at that time. And so whatever the food is there, it better be abundant. And they, I would think it has to be shallow as well that they're not going to be able to dive deep for 
at least a few days and maybe for a week or two. Well, this was the ship channel where we parked uh, on one season to Cape Colbert that uh, we went there. This was actually taken in 2013, but it's kind of a similar condition to uh, when we went in 1999. That's a great way to, to go through the millennium, you know, or start a new millennium was being out in the Easter Ross Sea. Well, here's the record we got from the, the APHIS crews uh, on, on one bird here. We tagged it in early February, right after it, it had molded, but it, it, it wasn't one of the ones that still had fresh uh, feathers on its coat. And it stayed back in the ice. This indicates where the ice edge is and up until the 15th of February. They stayed in the pack ice, but this is the bathymetry here, and they're over deep water this whole time. And what we got from the crews over, during that time was that apparently they do not feed on Antarctic silverfish, they feed on krill, which is abundant in the area. And then as they move across the slope and into the Ross Shelf, Ross Sea Shelf, they are. Uh, still in back in ice, they go south uh, for that reason, even though winter is coming on and the days are getting shorter. And then uh, the bird in this case started to move uh, northwest and in the month of April only took two weeks to reach Cape, Cape Crozier and, uh, and presumably breed. At that time, we don't know how long it stayed there because the uh, transmitters we had then, uh, the batteries would die. And uh, so that was the, would be the end of our story, unfortunately, that we couldn't get any records of birds going out and, and uh, feeding before they breed or uh, after they've laid the egg. Well, in summary, I believe the greatest peril for emperor penguin adults is the molt and the molt process. And the reason for that is that their body mass has to be, they have to have gained that weight I told you about, about 15 to 20 kilos by the time they get there. And they don't have any choice and they have stable ice they need for it, which we saw they have pretty good choice on that if they go to the right place. Some of them don't go to the right place and they end up on pretty small flows. And food has to be easy for them to fatten that fast, I would think. If any of these things fail and they don't get the weight and all that, what I mean by they don't have any choice is uh, they quite likely will die of starvation. And they're in such a remote area that if there was a, a, a major failure in the food production where they went and a major die off, we would never know about it. Well, in the summer for the dispersal of the chicks, this is probably the most dangerous time for them until they become adults and then when they get into the molt process. And they need safe seas. Now they're going into the Southern Ocean, which is one of the most remote areas in the world and <clears throat> on some of the roughest seas. And we don't know very much about the Southern Ocean in that sector of uh, uh, north of the Antarctic. And they need abundant krill and fish and they go so far north that I think by the polar front that's the same area where the king pin was come south to feed on uh, what they call lantern fish and my guess is that these juveniles probably feed on lantern fish. Well so let's ask the question about protection for for emperor penguins. Well I got the idea, they're so remote <clears throat> that uh, 
They don't need much protection to tell you the truth. It's so hard to get to them. As I said, access is everything. And for our research, access was really very demanding. And that's why there's probably no studies, as far as I know, going on about foraging or the behavior of that on emperor penguins at this time anywhere. We have established, we, many, all the nations of the world essentially, are signatory, may have, are signatories to it. And that's the general protection zone. And in this area, there's uh, no fishing and it's for the protection of the, of the, of all wildlife, uh, top and bottom. And the A area is a, uh, another one of those, this is, Sorry, I got mixed up there with that one. This is the, uh, that's more of a krill area, as is this uh, C area here. But the B area is a troublesome one because that's a special research area. What's the research about? It's a, about fishing for Antarctic cod. And uh, there is a fishery down there, and this is where it's supposed to be restricted for. And uh, so that's the protection. It's the largest marine protected area in the world. So. And in that regard, I would say that the emperor penguins are uh, pretty well off, and all of the, the Ross Sea uh, colonies are within that protected area. That's not true around the rest of the continent. Well, there was a lot of people that have worked on this with me, and, and it gave me great joy to know them and all. And I won't go through all the names, it's a long list, but. Uh, uh, and what's not mentioned in, in that list is all of the, the pilots that flew the planes for us, both the helicopters and twin otters, and the uh, uh, ship crews that got us to the eastern Antarctic as well. So I guess I would uh, uh, wrap this up as uh, that this is sort of my twilight of the Antarctic and, and uh, I can only say that any chance, and I know there's a few of you out there that are not emeritus yet, soon will be, and be thinking about what you're going to do next because a lot of it can be done after you retire. And thanks for your attention and, and uh, thanks for letting me give this talk.